All that is true is not naive, but all that is naive is true, but with the truth that is alluring, original, and rare. The solitary woman in Althea Thelberger's early video, Not Afraid to Die, from 2001, sits peacefully and thoughtfully in what appears to be a lush forest grove, her hands carefully folded on her lap. She is wearing a red and rust-colored all-weather shell, a garment commonly <coughs> worn on the west coast of Canada, which protects the wearer against wind and rain. This long-haired beauty is more country than elegant or urbane, but she is no less beautiful for that. Her eyes take in her surroundings with an air of carefree curiosity. Occasionally, she smiles. At other times, she appears pensive or mildly anxious, sometimes lost in reverie. On the soundtrack, large drops of water make musical splashing sounds while birds, squirrels, and chipmunks chatter away in the background. Over the hum of nature, a folksy acoustic ballad sung by the artist Althea Thilberger is introduced. She sings, I'm down in a hole, I'm down in a hole, down in a deep dark hole. Near the end of the song, we can hear a plane pass overhead. Is it possibly searching for our lone protagonist? She does not look lost. Eventually, she reaches around to her knapsack and retrieves her lunch bag. From inside, she takes out trail mix, a granola bar, and a drink box. After putting the trail mix back, she begins to eat, but her actions are self-conscious and awkward. She fumbles as she tries to drink and eat at the same time. When she is finished, she retrieves her lunch bag in order to store the leftover wrappers, but as she is doing so, she notices that some of the granola bar has fallen to the ground. She picks it up, brushes it off, and pops it into her mouth, pausing just for a second, smiling to herself as she swallows down the last bite. She then puts her lunch bag back in her knapsack, wipes a crumb from the corner of her mouth, and resumes her position. Despite the soundtrack, in the face of her unknown destiny, she appears optimistic and cheerful. Althea Thoberger was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in 1970 and studied photography at Concordia University in Montreal before getting her Master of Fine Arts at the University of Victoria in British Columbia in 2002. In Not Afraid to Die, the artist captures the essence of the Canadian female adolescent experience. Firstly, the constant backdrop of the Canadian wilderness, or the North, and secondly, the affinity young women can sometimes have for the melodramatic possibilities of any given situation, such as, for example, being lost or hiding out in a forest and having to survive in the woods on trail mix for an indefinite period of time, days, weeks, years even, in the snow. Part of the appeal of Not Afraid to Die is how it makes the viewer feel like he or she is eavesdropping on the solitary hiker. This effect is produced by the illusion that the young woman is totally unaware that she is being watched. Her apparent obliviousness heightens the thrill of secretly spying on her, and we get caught up in what might happen next. In this way, the art and the artist are made to disappear, and we are left alone with this intriguing character, and a slowly unfolding and permanently unresolved <coughs> plot. But the impression is not totally seamless. The moment when the hiker fumbles with her food, when just for a moment she lapses into self-consciousness, the effect quickly unravels. In that moment, the fiction that she is unaware of her audience is undone, because we know that in reality, Lana Mitchell is, of course, perfectly aware of our presence, or rather, to be more precise, the camera's presence. These relationships, the relationship between the artist and her subject, and the relationship between the work of art and its viewers, are of central importance to Thilberger's artistic practice. Using an approach similar to many other contemporary artists, Thoberger builds her projects by working directly with her subjects within their respective social and political spheres. Insofar as her relationship with these individuals and communities constitutes an integral component of the work itself, in a way her subjects are also her objects, like the radical post-war Parisian-based group known as the Situationists, though perhaps working with a lighter touch, Thoberger makes gentle interventions, creating situations that quietly shift the social and political relationships of the groups with which she works. Songstress from 2001-2002, A Memory Lasts Forever from 2004, the performance piece Murphy Canyon Choir from 2005, and Social Service Does Not Equal Art Project from 2006-2007, all, in one way or another, pivot on a collaborative project realized by the artist working with and across certain specific communities. This di dissolution of the usually fixed categories of producers and consumers means that in these artworks, in these situations, there is a fluidity to the relationships that exist between the artist and her subjects, and in turn, the relationship between the work of art and its viewers. Thoberger's ability to foreground and open up the audience for contemporary art has been duly noted and praised. 
But this aspect of the work has also drawn less positive comments, as the work is said to spotlight young women in their most vulnerable and perhaps most theatrical moments. In fact, theatrical is a word that is often used to describe the rigors of them. Uh, this subject of theatricality and art has been written about extensively and most famously by the art critic and art historian Michael Fried, first in his discussion of minimalism in his essay Art and Objecthood from 1967, and then later in his trilogy beginning with the book on 18th century painting, Absorption and Theatricality, Painting and the Beholder in the Age of Diderot. This essay will discuss what Michael Fried has called theatricality and the primacy of, of absorption in relation to Thelberger's new work, Northern, and we'll link it to motifs of reverie, sleep, and death, and some related examples of contemporary video and photography from the Vancouver School and beyond. This is uh, Jeff Wall's Citizen. Playing dead or playing possum has recently emerged as a theme in a variety of significant contemporary artworks. In her essay on Thoberger, Binna Choi has linked this current to Terry Eggleton's concept, derived from Beckett, of unkillability. Unkillability refers to characters who, being plagued by every sort of ineptitude, are too distracted even to die properly. Suicide also eludes them, and consequently they suffer a kind of resentful and stubborn immortality. Choi optimistically tempers this definition, suggesting that because the lives of these protagonists are interminable, they are to some extent free from the controlling systems of power, bureaucratic, economic, capitalist, what have you. She writes, when social systems exert the authority to determine, judge, and value your life, a kind of regression close to self-alienation comes to be called for, seems to be called for. Similar to the wise men in the children's story who saved his life by pretending to be dead when facing a lethal attack from a bear, we'd better face the state of exception or death ourselves before being put under sentence of death by powers beyond our control. By looking at the meanings brought to bear by these theatrical non-deaths, and examining how they connect to questions of absorption and the circumstances of contemporary life now, this essay seeks to open up our understanding of Thoberger's art, and in a broader way to deliberate upon what the recurrence of these themes might mean in relation to the depiction of landscape. In Art and Objecthood, written in 1967, Fried criticized what he called theatricality or the, the theatricality or literalist tendencies of minimalism for the way it engaged the viewer through conventions of address normally associated with theater rather than painting or sculpture. Later, using the writings of the French art critic and writer Denis Diderot, he would extend and expand this thesis. In Absorption and Theatricality, Fried made the argument that in the 18th century, a demand for a new kind of painting emerged. These new paintings had to embody a paradox. They had to, quote, find a way to negate or neutralize the presence of the beholder to establish the ontological fiction that no one is standing before the canvas. The paradox being that only if this is achieved can the beholder be captivated and held by the painting. The theory is that only when the audience is successfully captured in this way can the art and artist be made to disappear from the equation, thereby allowing the artwork to directly reach its audience and to become a mode of access to truth and conviction. In other words, it is the denial of the presence of the viewer that paradoxically opens the painting up to the viewer, and conversely, that the slightest impression on the beholder's part that the depicted personages were acting, or even worse, posing for him, was registered as theatrical in the pejorative sense of the term, and the painting was accordingly judged to be a failure. The relationship between the artwork and the audience, as mentioned before, is central to Thoberger's practice, but the question of theatricality and absorption is left open in these works. If we consider the video and photograph altogether, Thelberger appears to be thinking through these issues, drawing our attention to and testing the limits of these two mutually dependent categories. Not Afraid to Die, for instance, can be paired with the sea print Hiker's Bliss from 2001, from the same period, in which our formerly contemplative hiker now appears addressing the viewer straight on in an unnatural and unlikely pose that has more in common with shampoo commercials than absorption. Thoberger explains the difference between the video and the photograph made in the same year like this. The two works were partly an exercise in time-based work and photographic work. They were originally made as a diptych or inversions of each other. The actor model is the same person in the two works. 
Not Afraid was like a monument which had been stretched out in duration, or a work with movement that ultimately harkened stasis. And Hiker's Bliss was like an entire event, an entire event that had been compressed into a fraction of a second, and was a work that was frozen but ultimately harkened movement. I thought of these works as trying to exploit and subvert the essence of each specific medium. Just as Thoberger explains and subverts the essence of each specific medium, she also exploits and subverts the categories of absorption and theatricality. The two projects are one and the same, and the moment in Not Afraid to Die when Lana falters, when she momentarily hesitates, is when the issue crystallizes. Addressing this exact moment, Thoberger writes, because I could only afford two rolls of film, no margin of error, we tried and retried lots of things. The eating came up, and I asked her to eat in front of the camera. I started thinking of this predator-prey relationship when she is self-conscious and then kind of takes back the power when she is consuming the snack. Lana and I were pretty much on the same wavelength. She just kind of got it and was just allowing herself to be naturally uncomfortable in front of the camera and kind of playing herself as herself in front of the camera. What does it mean to play yourself as yourself in front of the camera? I think it means that in the instant between the juice box and the granola bar, Lana is conscious of being watched, or, as Michael Fried would say, of being beheld, and represents herself as such. Writing about the recent film Zeden, Un Portrait du XXe Siècle by Douglas Gordon and Philippe Perreno, Fried writes, The viewer's conviction of the great athlete's total engagement in the match is not thereby under undermined. Instead, the film lays bare a hitherto unthematized relationship between absorption and beholding, more precisely between the persuasive representation of absorption and the apparent consciousness of being beheld. In the context of art, a relationship that is no longer simply one of opposition or complementarity, but that allows a sliding and indeed an overlap that would have seemed unimaginable to Diderot. He continues. Zidane's inspired investigation of its protagonist's capacity for absorption under conditions of maximum exposure to being viewed, as well as the modified and shifting meaning of absorption itself under such conditions, makes it, if not a modernist film, at the very least a film that is of the greatest interest to anyone engaged by these and related topics. Like Zidane, in Thoberger's work, theatricality is thematized. And nowhere does this aspect of the work play itself out so dramatically as in the relationship Thoberger sets up between women and the landscape. The theme of, coming, of the coming of age of young women returns again and again in Thoberger's works. And this idea is explicitly linked to nature or the beautiful wilderness of the Canadian North. Not Afraid to Die and the accompanying photographs is only the first example. In songstress, winsome hippies sing their hearts out in a variety of unbelievably lush landscapes while in the rock opera, A Memory Lasts Forever, drunken middle-class girls beg God for guidance and forgiveness after the family dog drowns in the pool. Again, this preposterous scenario takes place in an impossibly green garden setting that could only be the suburbs of Vancouver. The theatricality and anti-theatricality of the women in Thilberger's videos are distracting to be sure, but there is a sense, and I am not the first person to notice this, that in fact these young girls are really only playing a supporting role. The real star of the show in Althea's videos is the landscape itself. National identity in Canada has always been inextricably intertwined with the depiction of the land, specifically northern landscapes. This paradigm draws its strength from two, two ideas. First, that geographically, the Canadian landscape rivals anything that the old world has to offer. And secondly, that the Canadian landscape is an eternal source and model of spiritual virtue. The early 20th century Canadian painter and theosophist, Lauren Harris, who painted one of the iconic images of Canadian art history, uh, North Shore Lake Superior from 1926, had this to say on the subject. We are on the fringe of the great North and its living whiteness, its loneliness and replenishment, its resignation and release, its call and answer, its cleansing rhythms. It seems that the top of the continent is a source of spiritual flow that will ever shed clarity into the growing race of America. And we Canadians, being closest to this source, seem destined to produce an art of somewhat different from our southern fellows, an art more spacious, of greater living quiet, perhaps, 
of more certain conviction of eternal values, we were not placed between the southern teeming of men and the ample replenishing virgin north for nothing. <laughs> Unbelievable. We know that landscape painting first emerged in Holland in the 17th century. Anne Jensen Adams has attributed this phenomenon to the fact that as the Dutch had no individual, such as a king or a queen, for example, in whom to invest the symbols of national identity, they turned to their land. According to Jensen, this new form of painting provided a sense of history and stability to a diverse population, which was at that time a dramatically fragmented society, thereby offering the illusion of security and cohesion where, in fact, none existed. In a similar way, since the beginning of the 20th century, Canada, a massive country, divided socially, culturally, linguistically, economically, and geographically, has also come to rely on a certain concept of the Canadian landscape to maintain a sense of community, specifically the concept of the pristine and pure virgin north. In its <coughs> most concentrated form, this idea manifests itself in the vision of the lone tree, symbolizing the resilience, ruggedness, independence, and the beauty of, this Canadian, of the Canadian spirit. Leaning heavily on the important precedent of the totem pole, which I just had here a minute ago, um, of the Northwest Coast, this motif can be observed in Canadian paintings throughout the 20th century, beginning with the group of seven, which was this, um, with Lauren Harris's North Shore Lake Superior, and then Tom Thompson's, a comparison, Tom Thompson's Jack Pine, um, but also famously in the works of the West Coast's most famous one of the West Coast's most famous women artists, Emily Carr. Forest landscape, this is forest landscape two from 1949. <clears throat> landscape was not considered a serious subject for high-minded art in the immediate post-war period, but in the 60s when the West began reckoning with the legacy of industrialism, it returned. In America with the development of land art and, and earth art. In Canada, it returned via conceptual photography. In the, in the 80s and 90s, works by Jeff Wall, Rodney Graham, Stan Douglas, and Roy Arden, all of whom were deeply influenced by conceptual art, all delivered treats in one form or another. <laughs> so we have, um, uh, this is uh, Rodney Graham's Detail of Flanders Trees from 1989. We have Jeff Wall's Pine on a Corner and from 1990, and Park, that's not Park Drive, that's Logs from 2002, and that's Park Drive um, from, I don't know, from 1994, and finally Stan Douglas's um, Gold River Mill from 1996. In these photographs, soaring mountain scenes are often visually circumscribed by factories and mills. For instance, at the bottom here, you can see the mill churning away. Hinting that this glorious landscape might be under threat from the forest industry, which happens to be one of the biggest industries in Canada. Canada has, after all, 10% of the world's forests. But as the ominous hairy eyeball that peers grotesquely, this is the best image I could get of it, um, that peers grotesquely out from in front of the lurking suburban home in the background in Roy Arden's tree stump, Nanaimo, BC from 1991, no matter what, suburbia is determined to get its own way. And that is one of the ironies of the Canadian psyche. We draw so much of our identity from the landscape, but cutting down trees is one of our specialties. The 19th century British author Anna Brunel Jameson made the observation that a Canadian settler hates a tree, <laughs> regards it as his natural enemy. It is something to be destroyed, eradicated, annihilated by all and every means. She goes on to say that there are two ways of killing a tree, by burning it and by draining the sap out of it. It is, is and then she says, is not this the two, like the two ways in which a woman's heart may be killed in this world of ours, by passion and by sorrow? This gap between what constitutes the imaginative vision of the Canadian landscape and the more complete truth of the matter is underlined in Thoberger's new video, Northern. In this film, the camera opens onto a tract of forest that has been completely ravaged by clear-cut logging, what tree planters refer to as slash. As the camera pans slowly to the left, the bodies of 12 men and w women, it's actually 13, isn't it? It's 13. <laughs> men and women come into view, entangled and strewn among the remains of a scarred and mutilated landscape, um, filled with uprooted dead wood, stumps and branches, their arms and legs akimbo, randomly piled, sometimes on top of one another, 
as if they have survived an explosion or some other natural catastrophe. The camera keeps moving left until the bodies are completely out of sight and comes to a stop before an idyllic alpine landscape made up of dark green rolling hills, beautiful soaring mountains, and an impossibly blue sky, complete with perfectly placed white clouds. The contrast between the ecological destruction on the right and the breathtaking scenery on the left could not be more striking. Slowly, gradually, we hear the sound of a helicopter. In seconds, we can identify it rising in the distance and then coming towards us before it lands in the foreground on an old logging road. A young woman gets out and pauses to take in the entirety of the situation and begins to wake up the survivors. As each one awakens, together they move to wake up the next person in a kind of chain, and so on, and so on, until they are all grouped together, looking searchingly out of the screen toward the horizon. Or sort of the horizon, because it's only for a split second that it appears as if they are looking at us. Heroically filmed in one long, gorgeous, continuous take, the action ultimately ends exactly where it began. This film draws its force from the combination of the representation of Canadian landscape with the radical traditions of French painting in the 19th century. The composition of Northern has been compared to, there's some shots of them laying on the slash, um, has been compared to Jericho's Raft of the Medusa from 1819. Um, but Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People from 1830, and also Jean-Louis Ernest Maisonnier's painting of Destroyed Barricades, Memories of Civil War from 1849, cannot be far behind, not to mention Marcel Duchamp's Etant d'Anne from 1968, just to name a few very important references to these work, I think. Jeff Wall's Dead Troops Talk, a vision after the ambush of a Red Army, Army patrol near Makor, Afghanistan, winter 1986-1992, must also be taken into consideration here, especially because both works address our theme of the undead, and because, make no mistake about it, Northern describes a state of siege. And I really apologize for this image, it was the best one I could get. Um, this, these two images are another Canadian photographer called Lorraine Gilbert, who in the 80s did a whole series on tree planting um, landscapes and sort of portraits of tree planters themselves so you can get a sense of what they look like when they're in their gear. Every year, thousands of young people, mostly students paying off university loans, um, travel hundreds of kilo kilometers from home into isolated and devastated clear-cut landscapes to plant trees in Canada. It is intense, back-breaking, and brutally repetitive work, and though it is often framed as an exercise in revitalizing the landscape, it is in fact the exact opposite of this. As Kate Quietenbrauer has written, tree planting is not reforestation. It is difficult to compare a replenished clear-cut to a forest. Perhaps we should call these constructs metaphorists, the forest as an ironic reminder of a forest. Thoberger herself worked in the forestry industry for 10 years as both a tree planter and as a foreman. In the summer of 2005, she worked in various remote regions of northern Alberta. Northern was filmed in, Kana, I've never been able to say this, how do you say it? Kananaskis. Um, uh, and features tree planters who came together under Thoberger's guidance to form a theatrical troupe. In the film, they appear as themselves in their own work clothes. In their own work clothes. You can see that they're in their contemporary tree planting gear, duct tape holding their pants to their boots, etc., to keep the flies out. Um, Freed discusses the relationship between the state of absorption and sleep, at some length in absorption and theatricality, guiding the reader through a plethora of examples, and goes so far as to say that absorption and unconsciousness are key to one another. This theme also surfaces in the work of Vancouver artists such as Rodney Graham, in Halcyon Sleep. Let's go back here. This is on the right is Rodney Graham and his work Halcyon Sleep from 1994. And more recently, and one might add more spectacularly, in Douglas Gordon's Play Dead Real Time from 2003. In the half hour long Halcyon Sleep from 1994, originally conceived as a performance piece, we see the artist sleeping in the backseat of a car being driven from the suburbs into the city. 
The static quali quality of the image, which was originally shown on a loop, links it to Rodney's other works that take up N Nietzsche's notion of the eternal return, such as Vexation Island and How I Became a Rambling Man, 98 and 99 respectively. Vexation Island also features an unconscious man who is knocked out by a falling coconut, only to regain consciousness, stand up, and be knocked out by a falling coconut, and so on. <laughs> the possibilities presented by video's endless loop has also been mar marvelously exploited in the Scottish artist Douglas Gordon's video, Play Dead Real Time, which features an elephant displayed in the white cube of the Contemporary Art Gallery, actually the new Gagosian, sort of new Gagosian gallery in New York, this elephant carefully lowers himself to the ground to play dead before standing up and then again slowly returning to the ground to play dead. This was the best image I could get of it. You can see the, the elephant lying down in the background and him standing up on the, on the left. Dreamy states are standard in Thoberger's compositions, from our hiker lost in reverie to our distracted chanteuse to the unconscious or even dead tree planters. But what might it mean to thematize rather than depict absorption and theatricality? The conclusion I want to, in, in the conclusion, I want to return to Fried's discussion of the Zidane film, where he discusses the protagonist's capacity for absorption under condition, conditions of maximum exposure to being viewed, as well as of the modified and shifting means of absorption under such conditions. This is the thinker from 2002. What is he getting at when he writes about this condition of maximum exposure to being viewed? Clearly, the stakes have changed dramatically, politically, socially, and aesthetically since 9-11. What can the notion of theatricality in art possibly mean at the beginning of the 21st century when theatricality is the dominant paradigm? i.e. the theater of war, the theater of homeland security, the theater of a free market economy, the theater of information, the theater of government, the theater of justice, the theater of democracy, the theater of freedom, etc. Just as the boundaries that separate the producers from the consumers of contemporary art have been blurred, so have the lines between theatricality and anti-theatricality, between the watchers and the watched. There are 16 spy agencies in the United States, more if you count the telephone companies, businesses, universities, and other institutions that pass along private information about their employees and or students. Absorption or anti-theatricality in such an environment becomes that much harder to sustain. When in 1990, when asked about his creative process, the poet Seamus Heaney mysteriously said that self-forgetfulness is the sine qua non of successful secret action. Self-forgetting, or what the French call oubli de soi, is close to an intense absorption and sleep. And in a footnote in Absorption and Theatricality, Fried quotes Melchior Grimm on the subject. Sleep, which appears to be a purely passive state, a kind of death, is, on the contrary, the first state of the living animal and the foundation of life. It is not a deprivation, an annihilation. It is a mode of being, of existing just as real and more general than any other. It is with sleep that our existence begins. Thank you. I, I suggest if there is an urgent question that you pose it now, directly. Your first work, the video. It was recorded in the studio or oh, outside? Yes, it was. I didn't say it beforehand because I sort of wanted okay. that to unfold for, okay, for the viewers. But yes, it was recorded in. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll say it into the microphone. Um, <laughs> it was recorded in um, a natural history museum. All right. Oh. Um, and so you see what you, the background that you see is um, a diorama. Okay. And it's 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 a, a a recreation of a forest, which is okay. like the Northwest Rain Forest, which is a depiction of the natural environment of that actual place where it was filmed. Yeah. It was cultural. This question was all the time in my mind. Well. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <coughs> You 
have such an intimate um, and sensitive um, observation on the Canadian psyche, but are you from Canada? Because you don't seem like you're from Canada. Canada. It's a question. I'm she actually, is actually so. Oh, I'm from Newfoundland. You're from Newfoundland. And it must be, okay. this, it must be, I'm from Newfoundland. Because Newfoundland only joined Canada in 1949, and we have a kind of resistance to all things Canadian. And many of us don't even describe ourselves as Canadian. But yes, I am Canadian. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's <what> <laughs> But do you find the difference in uh, do you find the difference in depiction of nature in other Canadian artists and the artists? Uh, yeah, in terms of theatre gallery or like what kind of difference do you do you see? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because actually one of the ideas behind this talk originally was to talk more about the construction of Vancouver and how Vancouver is generally and I didn't talk about it in the essay, but it was the original point of, but it sort of, it, it got science right. But one of my, one thing that's very particular about Vancouver is that because of the very spectacular landscape, um, the fact that it rains eight months of the year is completely elided. <laughs> and so what happens is in the work of kind of photo conceptual artists like Jeff Wall, Arden, Walter Ro uh, Rodney, etc you get kind of a, a, what I call a supernatural socialist realism. <laughs> a kind of Canadian supernatural socialist realism where it's always sunny all of the time in Vancouver, which is a lie because I did my master's there and I can tell you, I was there for six years and I can tell you that it rains quite a lot. And it does funny things to the people there. Um, and I think it does shift um, just um, imperceptibly, but I think in sort of middle Canada is where the group of seven really, you know, that's that's their home and, and they really do do this kind of white snow pure which is completely which is a little bit different than these this kind of all enveloping geography of the West Coast. But it's something that I think a lot more could be written about and that I'm interested 